Welcome to Condo Insider on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Attorney Nalan. Joining me today is our guest, Attorney Trad Ierly, an expert on insurance law and my fellow director of our law firm, Deminki Leon Kupchak Hester. Trad once again was selected by his peers for inclusion in the 2023 edition of Best Lawyers in America for his work in insurance law, litigation insurance, and commercial litigation. He was also named Best Lawyers 2022 uh, Litigation, um, litigation uh, Insurance uh, Lawyer of the Year in Honolulu. Trad is also recognized by super lawyers in the area of insurance coverage and in the top 25 Hawaii super lawyers list. He's the author of the very popular legal blog, www.insurancelawhawaii.com. He is regularly presented at American Bar Association Insurance Coverage Conference and published in the ABA's Coverage Journal. As we all know, many homeowners and businesses who suffered loss in the Maui fire are currently navigating the insurance claim process. Total loss from property damage and business interruption caused by the devastating fire was believed to be over $4 billion per recent news report. I, along with my colleagues, recently participated in the HSBA's legal line for Maui. Many questions received are insurance-related. For example, vendors approached homeowners representing themselves as independent public adjusters, soliciting business and alleging they can help homeowners recover loss. Many are wondering whether these are legitimate inquiries or scammers and what they need to do. So today, I invited Tra to share with us some basic information on the claims, tendering, adjusting, and settlement process, roles of different type of adjusters, and insurance coverage attorney. Hope the information provided will be useful to the people you need. Welcome, Trad. Thank you, and thank you for the nice introduction. So Trad, um, I believe many um, homeowners now have located their paperwork, probably has already tendered to insurance. And they are now in this process. Can you help us, uh, you know, point out some of the considerations the uh, business owners, homeowners, they should keep in mind uh, when, you know, filing this claim uh, and then, you know, cooperating with the insurer to provide information and documents? Yes. Um, so, yes, hopefully by now, um, insureds have given notice of the loss to their insurers. Some uh, policies have time sensitive reporting deadlines, but certainly, you know, three weeks out from the fire is still well within the period for uh, submitting a claim. And as you, as you noted, it's important to cooperate with the insurance company. There's typically a duty to cooperate in the policy. So they are, the, the insurance company is probably going to request, um, records, deeds, pictures, anything that you have to substantiate your loss and coverage uh, items under the policy. And uh, insurers should keep paying their premiums to make sure, you know, the policy is current and valid throughout this period, right? That's important. Yes, that's, Im that's important to keep the policy valid, to keep, uh, payment of premiums and, and cooperate with the insurance company. Uh, so now let's um, move on to the adjuster topic here. So what is an adjuster and what do they do? Uh, what are the different types of adjusters out there? So there are several different types of adjusters. One is an adjuster for the insurance company. And of course they're looking out for the interests of the insurance company. There might be an on the ground adjuster who comes to investigate. Sometimes that is a company adjuster who's sent out by the company or an independent adjuster that's hired by the insurance company to come and inspect the loss. And then an advocate for the insured is a public adjuster. There are three or four good public adjusters in Hawaii, and they assist the insured in investigating and substantiating the loss, they typically charge a percentage of what your recovery might be. So if there's no recovery, there would be no charge. 
So uh, the insurer doesn't have to pay anything for the company adjuster or independent adjusters, but they need to be prepared to be willing to pay the public adjuster, right, according to their contract. And um, there are laws in Hawaii requiring licensing and bond for public adjusters, right? So people can try to look that up to see if the vendor who approached them are legitimate or not. That's correct. And, and I'd be surprised if a good public adjuster is on the ground trying to solicit business in Lahaina. But, you know, there's a public adjuster, Robert Jocelyn in um, Wailuku, and there are a couple of public adjusters here on Oahu. They're all good. And um, so, but there's a question that, uh, okay, so your public adjuster help you put together, um, estimate the damage. Is there an obligation for the insurer to just accept that estimate or they can disagree? Uh, you mean the estimate from the insurance company? Yes, the insurance yes. company can disagree with the estimate provided by the public adjuster, right? Co correct, yes. The, they will likely have an estimate from their own adjuster, uh, which may be, be different from that of the public adjuster. So when the parties are in disagreement, how do they resolve their uh, you know, disputes? So typically there is an appraisal procedure in the policy. And if the parties disagree on the amount of the loss, the dollar value of the loss, either party can give notice to the other that they want to invoke the appraisal provision. And typically each side appoints one, their appraiser, one appraiser, and then the two appraisers, if they cannot agree on the dollar value of the loss, then they appoint an umpire who is the final decision maker and deciding the amount of the loss. And then the insured and the insurer would each pay for their appraiser and then typically split the cost for the umpire. Thank you. And then the, the appraisal process can be, it depends on the policy language, but it could be determined just uh, on the basis of written materials submitted, or there could be an actual hearing that's like an arbitration to determine the dollar value of the loss. The appraisers do not um, determine the cause of the loss. They only determine the dollar value of the loss suffered by the property. And uh, according to the Post-Disaster Claims Guide published by National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which our audience can download a copy from our DCCA website, uh, there are two tips uh, given in this guide. One is uh, public adjuster should always provide the insured a contract, which explains the scope of services they're going to provide to the insured and how much the insured will pay. And uh, the, the other tip they give is if you hire a public adjuster before the insurer, uh, insurance company uh, provided an initial offer, has made already made an initial offer, then always ask about the fee. And the contract should clarify if the fee you will pay to the public adjuster will be based on the total the insurance company pays or on the amount the public adjuster negotiates for you. That will make a difference there. Um, and now let's move on to coverage console. Uh, in the worst scenario, and there are many people out there that will be a desperate situation when the insurance company denies coverage or you know, there's a super long delay uh, in adjusting the claim or when not issuing payments. And then you know, um, you know, we'll be thinking about that's a good time to get uh, coverage console involved. So what is the typical, uh, you know, like the prop, procedure or process where the insurer notifies the insured of its coverage possession. There's always the co concept called reservation of rights for, you know, common people with no legal background. What does that mean? So when the insurer is not approving the claim and maybe they're investigating or they, they need more information, they will typically send a reservation of rights letter advising the insured of possible exclusions or reasons for denying the claim, explaining that they're not sure at this point 
if the claim will actually be excluded because they're still doing an investigation, but they are reserving their rights to deny the claim based upon certain provisions in the policy. And as they continue their investigation, they may decide there is no coverage and they'll send a denial, a, a denial letter. Or on the other hand, they may agree that there is coverage and then agree to a payment. So then that's when they will probably propose a settlement offer to the homeowner or business. Um, and But what about the payment part? Are, is it going to be a lump sum or multiple payments? Uh, how does that work? It depends. Sometimes early in the investigation, the insurance company realizing that there probably is a covered loss may make a partial payment and then continue its investigation to see if further payments are warranted. Or it could be that the insurance company, you know, in, in a fire loss, that's generally covered by a homeowner's or a commercial business policy. And the insurer may just decide to pay a lump sum for the loss. And then again, if the insured disagrees on the amount of the payment, and thinks they are not being fully compensated, they have the option of invoking the appraisal process. I see. I mean, there's going to be situations where, you know, very quickly a homeowner could get a very shady settlement offer. Um, you know, you may be really short on cash. Is it a good idea to rush to accept that claim or even some insurer may present release paperwork immediately, accept this and sign this paperwork. That would be that would be a big no-no, right, for insurers. Yes, I think that's correct. Uh, you know, at that point, I think it would be prudent for the <clears throat> insured to contact a public adjuster because they can help the insured evaluate the amount of the loss and and advise on what might be covered and what benefits are due under the policy. When should an uh, insurer consider, you know, like higher escalating, you know, getting an insurance coverage attorney like you, getting your assistance? Well, I think some insureds may want a coverage attorney at the outset to help guide the process. So after the Maui fires, you know, some large companies, big businesses, have hired coverage counsel right away to help orchestrate uh, putting the claim together, you know, business interruption claim mm -hmm. and having a coverage counsel sort of oversee what's, what's being done and what's being offered to the insurance company. A homeowner, maybe it's a little more difficult to go out and hire a coverage lawyer. They may want to wait and work with the public adjuster. Mm -hmm. And if it looks as though they're not being treated fairly or their claim is about to be denied, then they may want to talk to a coverage counsel who can <clears throat> more easily argue the merits of the claim and try to dissuade the insurance company from denying the claim. And if that doesn't work, then of course the coverage counsel <clears throat> with the approval of the insured can prepare and file a lawsuit, a coverage lawsuit to recover benefits under the policy. If the insurance company <clears throat> denies a claim and the insured is forced to file a lawsuit, and if the insured prevails in the lawsuit and from the court gets an order to pay benefits, then the insured under a statute in the insurance code can recover reasonable attorney fees in addition to the benefits under the policy. That's a great to know. And uh, we've all heard about the concept uh, insurer bad faith. Uh, so what is that? And what are some typical examples of potential bad faith claims um, an insurer can make against an insurance company? So under Hawaii law, bad faith is defined as unreasonable behavior by the insurance company. So it doesn't have to be malicious, doesn't have to be willful, but if it's an unreasonable decision, 
So <clears throat> if there's no dispute that it should be covered, such as a fire loss, and the insurance company does not have a good basis for denying the claim, that it would be unreasonable for them to deny the claim. So that would be grounds for a bad faith lawsuit. Even if there's no coverage under the policy, if the insurance company mishandles the claim, in other words, they're not responding to the insured's inquiries, <clears throat> if there's a long delay and they're investigating the claim, if they're losing documents and repeatedly asking for documents that they already have, that may be deemed unreasonable by a court and could be an act of bad faith, even if there's no coverage under the policy. Wow. So who has the burden of proof to establish such a claim? So the, the insured has the burden of proof to show that the insurance company has been unreasonable. And then the insured has to show how they've been damaged. There has to be damage because that's an element of bad faith. Mm -hmm. But if there's a long delay and the, in, the insured is having to pay out of pocket, you know, to mediate the loss or, you know, to fix or replace damaged property, then that's probably a good indication of damage that the insured can recover. And then, of course, if it's really bad, if it's really willful, wanton, unconscionable, the insured can also make a claim for punitive damages, which is designed to punish the insurance company for really egregious bad faith. So uh, if an insured um, believes there is such a bad, be bad faith going on, um, wh what kind of evidence they should start gathering to be prepared for you know, a potential action down the road or consultation with coverage counsel? I think it would be good to keep notes on all communications with the insurance company, keep all <clears throat> written communications, make notes on any phone calls back and forth with the insurance company especially if there's a delay in processing the claim, it would be very important to know the dates upon which communications were had and what the insured is asking for and what the response of the insurance company is. Let's see, you know, assuming I'm a homeowner, I got a call from the insurance um, side and I can turn on the audio recording on my phone, record that. Since it's in Hawaii, one party consented to that, that would be admissible evidence, right? Right. Um, yeah, so um, let's see, give some examples. If, you know, an insure, insurance company made a, a you know, wrong decision um, not to pay the claim, um, is that enough to prove there's bad faith? It may not be because... It has to be unreasonable. So if there's a difference in interpretation of the policy and whether or not a claim is covered and the insurance company is not being unreasonable, maybe it's an issue that has not been decided in Hawaii. So it may not be unreasonable for the insurance company to deny the claim. But if it's obvious, if there's established cases or if the language in the policy is clear that there should be coverage and the insurer is still denying coverage, that could amount to an unreasonable denial and raise to the level of bad faith. Uh, are there, uh, what is the uh, Hawaii statute limitation or time bar on this kind of action against insurance companies? So it's unclear if a bad, under Hawaii law, if bad faith is a breach of contract or a tort claim. A breach of contract statute of limitations is six years, but for a tort, it's two years. So we always advise clients who may have a bad faith claim that they need to file any claim for bad faith within two years of, you know, whatever the bad faith action might be. That reminds me of another provision in the policy 
in some policies, in addition to the statute of limitations, there may be a suit limitation provision, which says if you're going to sue the insurance company, you have to do so within a certain number of years stated in the policy. So the statute of limitations may be two or six years, but the suit limitation provision may say you have to sue us with within one year. Mm -hmm. And that would prevail over the statute of limitations. What is the typical process uh, for a homeowner or business to resolve coverage dispute with the company, insurance company? So the, the typical process is I think for the insured to communicate with with the insurer to try to get some relief. If that doesn't work, then I think it's time to consult with the coverage counsel, who's probably going to write a detailed letter arguing why there should be coverage, breaking apart all the language of the policy, going over the substance of the loss, and arguing that there's coverage. Typically, the insurance company is not swayed by the coverage letter or the demand letter from the attorney. So unfortunately, that means that the next step is to file a lawsuit against the insurance company. Uh, is it a typical for an insurance contract to also have ADR clause? Um, and would that be binding upon the insurer? Yes, um, there are policies that provide for even sometimes mediation and also provide for binding arbitration. So if there is such a provision and if neither side, if one of the two sides does not agree to waive the arbitration provision, then the dispute would go to arbitration instead of going to court. I see. Thank you so much for your time. I think we've covered a lot of information and we want to wrap it up, um, you know, like for the people who are navigating that difficult and will be very likely will be very lengthy process. Um, if you make three, you know, like summarized uh, advice or suggestions, what would you say to them? First of all, uh, read your policy. If you are having trouble understanding the policy, then consult with a lawyer. Secondly, if you're having problems <clears throat> with the insurance company and you're having problems collecting information and establishing the amount of the loss, I would consult with a public adjuster. And thirdly, I would consult with coverage counsel if you're still getting nowhere after working with a public adjuster and consider the possibility of having to file a lawsuit. Yeah, and also I think you should definitely do due diligence, you know, before you, you know, hire the or pay out of pocket for your public adjuster cuz there may be bad guys, you know, engaging in kind of scams post disaster which which is horrible, but you know, you don't want to be, you know, victim again in that kind of post disaster scams. And uh, if you have, I think if you have difficulty affording attorney, the HSBA right now has expanded its legal hotline uh, to serve Maui residents. And um, before it was only run on one hour on Wednesdays, but now the program is going to run on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays till September 21st from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And the hotline number is 808-537-1868. And many of my colleagues and my peers uh, of the bar, we've been all volunteering our time. There are also attorneys who take on pro bono representations at this point to try uh, to help as a community. Uh, our prayers are with all the people who lost their life or you know, properties, suffered loss in the fire and uh, wish them the best. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Trad. Aloha. Aloha.